63. Good morning. That's good. Wow. All righty. Man, everybody got it together this morning. That's good. That is good. We're in the middle. If you're a guest with us, we're not in the middle. This is the second sermon of our VBS series that will be starting here in a couple of weeks, a week and a half. And uh, last week we talked about that Jesus is worthy to follow. We talked about, you know, Peter of catching such a great amount of fish in the beginning of the call, the commission that, that Jesus gave him. And so throughout this series, throughout the VBS lessons, we're going to be looking at Peter, the twists and the turns of Peter's life. We said that, you know, when we play video games today, our kids, one of the, you know, the things that catches them is the twists and the turns of everything that takes place. I said, you know, back in the day, Candyland in my day had had its twists and turns. Uh, and then for those of you to show your age, if you'll remember, I said something about those, uh, that old Oregon Trail. The twists and turns were a little slower there because you were on a broadband and it took forever to get the computer to work. So, you know, you, on your way there, you could go into the kitchen, make a sandwich and come back and find out if you were dying from dysentery. And that's what most of you died from before you ever got across the river. So, uh, you know, we, we understand life and its twists and turns in life. Everything is about that. That's why we're looking at Peter. And today we're going to take a look at Peter and we're going to see that through his life, Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus is trustworthy. So I want you to think about that. But I want to ask a question this morning, all of us. Uh, I don't know that I want you to scream it back because uh, I don't know that I really want to know, but maybe I will ask for some. I want you to think, what's the most radical thing you have ever done? What? Yeah, okay. What is the most, that person knew before I got done with the question. I know where she's sitting, and so let me say this to all the women in the, in the room. All the women watching right now, the most radical thing you ever did, you cannot say marrying your husband. Okay? She's taking notes, and she's not going to look up because she knows she's writing down right now. I married Adam Booth. There is nothing more radical than that. Anybody, I mean, what, what's the most radical thing any of you ever done? He just never done anything radical. Wow, you ought to come with me, all righty? You ought to come with me. I'm going to look over here because, okay, yeah, there's Dom. Dom, what's the most radical thing you've ever done? Um, I, um, I, my, I won the first round of Fortnite. Oh, you won the first round of Fortnite you ever played. How about jumping out of the golf cart with your pop-pop and jumping back in the golf cart? Yeah, that's pretty radical, right? We did that Friday, so we'd have a story to tell. His mother doesn't know that, so we could just keep that right in here, all righty? You know, the reason we do radical things, I'll back up, I'll go, Caleb, Caleb's done some radical things here. I remember the day we jumped off a 60-foot cliff into water, you broke, you busted your uh, eardrums and had to have surgery. I broke my tailbone and should have had surgery. You know, what a day, what a day. But we, you know, you don't want to hang around with the Sigers boys, that's for sure. You don't want to hang around us very long. We do radical things because of something called Adrenaline. We do them, and there are people, and we have one son in our family that he does things. If you follow Colin Sigers on Instagram, follow him, you're going to see one guy that lives on the edge of everything that he does. His whole life is about the adrenaline rush. I take fault of that because when he was about four or five, Jake is here. I took Jake and Colin and threw them off of about a 25-foot dock into, the, into Grand Lake. I think that got Colin started. It wised Jake up. Jake said, never again, Dad, never again. I'm done. That was all the adrenaline I need. We live sometimes, sometimes we live by adrenaline because you see what, what adrenaline comes many times when we are faced with that fear or flight situation and danger and fear in our lives. What makes us move or what makes us decide to stop and fight is adrenaline. Adrenaline is the substance that is released in the body of a person who is feeling a strong feeling such as excitement, fear, or anger. The adrenaline rush usually occurs when the body senses danger, the flight or fight uh, moment in their lives. This morning, we're going to take a look at Peter and his life and look at the disciples and realize that they are living in a fight or flight situation. They don't know what to do. They are faced with danger, they're faced with fear, but it was only one person that did something so radical that we still talk about it today. It was one of those first lessons I remember in the beginner class at the First Christian Church of Oklahoma, Mississippi. 
when I saw that and, and the teacher, you know, someone just like Miss Joyce, and she would remember she had, Miss Joyce, she had a flannel graph up there, and she taught us by, you know, taking the flannel graph board and doing it back and forth for the storm, and I was awestruck. I was awestruck with a guy that could walk on water. I'm not sure that the first time I ever heard it that I listened to the whole lesson because all I could imagine is that someday I want to walk on water. Now, I've only walked on water one time, and that's when a friend of mine by the name of Ronnie Buster was pulling me on a ski boat too fast, and I came out of the skis, and for about four steps holding on to the rope too long, I walked on water. <laughs> I also drank half the lake that, that afternoon also. Back in the day, I know it was Caleb's. It is still one of my favorite. I'm a little bit, not quite as bad as Austin Weiss, but one of my favorite series of movies is Indiana Jones. Now, I'm not going to talk about number four with you today. I don't know why that was made, and I didn't like it. But the other four, and especially the first night it came out, Jamie had to go with me to see Indiana Jones and that last one that he ever made. But my favorite is Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Indiana Jones is always on the search of artifacts, historical artifacts. And these are usually some sort of symbol of life that he's always after. And in this particular movie, if you remember it, there's also another archaeologist that is also in search of what is called the Holy Grail. Now, the Holy Grail is the cup, the chalice, supposedly legendary, that Jesus and the disciples drank out of at the Last Supper. And if you could drink out of, find and drink out of the Holy Grail, you would experience eternal life and powers beyond your imagination. The other archaeologist that is looking for the Holy Grail is Dr. Henry Jones, Indiana Jones's father. But not only are these two guys ending up looking for the Holy Grail, Hitler's looking for the Holy Grail as along with a man named Walter Donovan. Now, Henry Jones has put together a book of riddles and obstacles that they have to get through. And when they come to the final place and needing of life, if you'll remember, Indiana Jones's father's been shot. He's laying there dying on this cave floor. Indiana Jones has his little journal with him with all of the things that his dad has searched and researched and gone over. And he's finished with three riddles that he has to answer. And so as he goes through, the first riddle, if you'll remember, says this. A penitent man, only a penitent man will pass. Only a penitent man will pass. And if you remember, he's going through the cave. He's saying that to himself. A penitent man. What is a penitent man? A righteous man. What does he do? A, a penitent man, as he sees the skulls of other people that have tried to go through there, he hears the noise of the blades coming. He doesn't know what's going to happen. But he realizes a penitent man is a man who kneels before God. And when he kneels, the blades go by, and he gets through the first riddle, and he's safe. The second riddle is simply this. In the footsteps of God, a righteous man will pass. And he comes to a place there on the floor that there's an alphabet before him. And he's repeating to himself, if you remember that. You were sitting on the edge of your seats. He's repeating that, that over and over again to himself. A righteous man in the footsteps of God, a righteous man will pass. In the footsteps of God, a righteous man will pass. And he steps out, and as he steps out upon the, the footsteps of God, Jehovah, he steps on the J, and it breaks, he falls through, but it's his rope that saves him, or the whip. It's his whip that saves him. What, that whip has done more to destroy life than any other thing. He pulls himself back up. He gets up. He brushes himself off, and he thinks, wait a minute. It's written in Latin. It's not written in English. In Latin, the word Jehovah, uh, Yahweh starts with an I, and so he spells it out because he knows it. Get that? He knows how to spell in Latin, and he's able to cross over, stepping in the name of Jesus. Now, the first two riddles, he knew something about. The first two riddles, he could figure out with his mind and with the wisdom and the study that he'd done with his life. The third riddle calls upon something totally different. For the third riddle, if you remember, it says this, a leap from the lion's head, will a man prove his worth? A leap from the lion's head, a man will prove his worth. That very dramatic moment in that movie where they come out and he steps out of the cave and he's over a great chasm, a bottomless pit. There beside him on his right is a lion's head and he repeats to himself, in the footsteps, in the footsteps, He's thinking over and over again, a leap from the lion's head will prove, a man will prove his worth, a leap from the lion's head. You see this last riddle as he takes in that very dramatic moment, that boot out over, and I can't stand one-legged anymore, but that boot, 
as he's ready to step out upon nothing, suddenly there's a pathway as his foot comes down. Suddenly it wasn't what he knew that made the difference. It was his faith to step out that made the difference. It was his faith to take that first step that he could walk across to the other side. It was his faith to step out. In this morning's story about Peter, we see the same thing. There comes a point in time where I know that is Jesus. I know that we're going to die, but I'm going to take faith and step out of the boat. I don't know if you've watched this scene in The Chosen, but I, we edited it a little bit, and I want you to watch this scene from The Chosen. If you've not seen The Whole Chosen, you need to go home this afternoon, and you need to begin to watch it. Let's play this scene right here. We can't take much more water. We'll founder. Better off wet and cold on land and drown and get out here. Don't keep growing. What are you doing? Did anybody just see that? Over there. Go! Go! Get them go! 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 Let's go! It can't be. Go! Go! Faster! Let's go! go. go. Nobody move! Simon, what? I said everybody stop! Stop, stop, stop! Hey, stop! Nobody move! That's not a ghost! Are you crazy? We don't know that, Jesus, uh, that Peter ever said that to Jesus. But we'd have to imagine that was probably his words. Don't let me go. And those words need to be spoken today as loudly and as confident that Peter was saying to Jesus. Don't let me go. You are trustworthy. I know now you are trustworthy. The background of this whole scene is the the fact that Herod has beheaded Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. He's dealing with that. He's beginning to see the end coming. He's beginning to see how all the pieces of the puzzle are beginning to come together. He's beginning to see his mission and his call. Peter has just been a witness to Jesus feeding the 5,000. We, we preached about that sometime back, that, that more than likely there were 20,000 people that Peter was able to to take and to feed 20,000 people with two fish and five loaves. 
He had seen what Jesus had done. As a matter of fact, in John the sixth chapter, John says that the people, when Jesus got done feeding, the people came and said, we want to make you king. And that's why Jesus left them. He sent them on a cross to go to the other side of the lake while he went up and prayed. He was faced with the temptation that, oh, Father, we can do this now. I can take over now. They, they want me. They see me. He had to go pray. But in the middle of that night, walking in that water, the adrenaline was flowing. These men, if you want to go ahead and take your Bibles, we're going to read here in just a second from Matthew, the 14th chapter. We're going to read it from what Matthew says, but these men we're going to see are fearful. The adrenaline is flowing. Only four of them are fishermen. The other eight men are just there to really help. It's the fishermen that right now are having to guide them through, but all of them, even the fishermen, are scared. Storms are known to come down upon the Sea of Galilee at 686 feet below sea level. This would happen all the time. I'll reference it a couple times already in Matthew, the eighth chapter. Peter's been in the boat with Jesus while Jesus slept and a great storm came upon the lake. You see, they're experiencing the adrenaline of do we step out or do we stay in this boat? Starting in verse 22 to read what the text says from Matthew, it says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. And at about three o'clock in the morning, for some time now, I would have to imagine that these guys have been fighting the waves because these fishermen that are used to these storms, these fishermen who know how to navigate their boat, have delegated guys are taking water and getting water out of the boat. They're trying to scream commands. But at about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified, oh, for sure. And in fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. Remember those words. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, he said, come. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and he grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said to him. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God. You see, in this story, we need to understand, as I said, there's the background. Here is this sea, these storms that have come up. These men are scared to death. They're crying out. They're yelling orders at each other. I'm sure sometime, somewhere along the way, James and John might have figured, let's get out of this boat and leave the other 10 guys to fend for themselves. I don't want it. I don't want their lives on my hands. We're going to die. It's not the first time that these guys have been scared enough to make that claim that we're going to die. And suddenly, as they look out over the boat, what else could be there? In your own minds, in your own logic, what else could be in front of you but a ghost? Now, you see, in my imagination, they didn't do it on the chosen. They didn't ask me to write a little bit of this for them. But you know what we do when we all think there's a ghost somewhere? We hit the floor, we try to hide. As if a ghost that can walk on water and walk through walls wouldn't hide, find us in the bottom of a boat. I can just see them. They've all, hit, they've all hit the deck. There's a ghost. They've hit the deck. They're afraid they're going to die, and now there's a ghost. Somebody's already coming to get us. But one brave soul looks over the side of the boat and goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's not a ghost. Look. It's Jesus. That's Jesus. We need to understand something in your notes this morning. Peter was convicted 
So he stepped out of that boat. He was convicted that that was Jesus Christ. That's who he said he was when I asked, when I wondered, who is it? It is Jesus that tells me the truth. In verse 28, it is me. Don't be afraid. Do you remember the last time that Peter heard those words? It was just last week. Luke, the fifth chapter. When he caught all those fish, he fell down in the middle of those fish, and the first words from Jesus were, don't be afraid. Jesus is reminding us all the time the storms of life that we go through. He's just simply telling all of us, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid when the doctor calls. Don't be afraid when the papers show up. Don't be afraid when they walk into your office. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I've got you. I'm right here with you. This is not a ghost. This is the plan. This is my will. Don't be afraid. He was convicted. He knew exactly who that was. And he had got out, stepped out of that boat. My friends, the encouragement, the challenge that I want to give to us today, Peter walked on water. We need more water walkers. We need more men and women to get out of the boat of life when the storms are coming, to be willing to get out of the boat and to begin to walk on water because they are focused on Jesus Christ. He had a conviction that was Jesus He had a conviction because he knew that Jesus could fill a boat with fish. He could feed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. That he could walk on water or turn water into foundation stone so that man could walk on it. He was convicted. The Bible is filled with people of conviction. Ruth, in the first chapter of Ruth, after she has lost her husband, she's a Moabite, she's lost her brother-in-laws, she's lost her father-in-law and Her mother-in-law, Naomi, is going to go back to her hometown. Just going to go back. And in that first chapter, verses 16 through 18, Ruth says this, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Where you go, I will go. Wherever you are, wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing. Ruth was determined in the storm of her life to not turn around and to not go back. And when you look in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you find out that it was Ruth that was the great, great grandmother of King David and the line that Jesus would come through because she was convicted that she was going to go. My friends, today we need to be people of conviction. You need to know about the Word of God. What do you believe about the Word of God? Is this the inerrant words from the heart of God written by men and women for us that we can live life for Jesus Christ today? What are you convicted about Jesus Christ? Is he the Son of God that rose from the dead physically to promise us that when we put our faith in him, we too can rise from the dead. We will be resurrected on the day of glory to reign with him forever in heaven. What do you believe about sin? My friends, what are we convicted about in our marriages? What are we convicted about at our work where we work? What are we convicted about today? Not only that, then in verse 29, Peter was convicted. He stepped out of that boat. But in verse 29, he was committed, and he walked out from that boat. You know what I think? My first words, if I'd have been Peter and and Jesus said, it's me, I would have said, because I've experienced Matthew 8, I would have said, oh, Jesus, why why don't you just calm that storm and get in the boat with us? Come on, buddy. I know you can do that. Just get in this boat and come on in here with us and help us bail out water. Just calm the storm. We got some place to go. No. You see, because that's what most of us would have done, right? Anytime a storm comes in our life, what we begin to do is we begin to look around and go, oh, God, take this storm away from me. And God is saying it is by the storm in your life 
that I can move in your life to do great things in your life. It's by the storms in your life that I will be able to shine the grace and show people that you're willing to get out of that boat, that you're willing to live in that storm and to walk with me in the middle of that storm so that people can see the light of Jesus Christ shining in your light. Now you notice from this, you notice that, first of all, I would say nobody else tried to get out of that boat and go with him. You even got the sons of thunder there. You got the sons of thunder. They wouldn't even try to get out of the boat. As a matter of fact, they did what my imagination would be. Peter, get back in this. Peter, get in. What are you thinking about, Peter? Peter, we're fishermen. You're, you know nobody walks on water. What are you doing? Get in here. But Peter was committed. And you see, when everybody in the world, like we said last week, when everybody in the world says you're too young, you're too old, you don't have the equipment, you don't have the know-how, you don't have what it takes, Peter said, I'm going to get out of the boat and I'm going to walk to Jesus. You may not have what the world says you need, but I'm here to tell you today, all we need in the storms of our life is Jesus Christ. That's all we need to do the physically and the spiritually impossible. But it took from him self-sacrifice to say it's not my life that is important. It is not what's going to happen to me that is the problem. Is I want to walk on water to Jesus. It's all or nothing. So this morning, my plea again, it's all or nothing, friends. In verse 30, we see Peter walked out, but Peter chickened out. Peter walked out of that boat, but he chickened out when he got out there. Well, why? I think it's understandable, right? I mean, come on. We're doing something that is physically, the physics tell us it's impossible for us to walk on water. There is no way, no way this can happen after a few steps, I really think that, that, that he took a lot farther than what they have there. I believe he probably got 10, maybe 15 feet out on that water, far enough away that the boat was no longer in his sight. But what was in his sight was the waves and the storm. What was in his sight were the things that were around him that were allures or fears in his life. And when he took his eyes, when he took his focus off of Jesus, he began to sink. My friends, I want to tell you today that in the storms of our lives, we cannot lose our focus because two things, we're all going to face a storm. We live in a fallen, broken, evil world, and we are going to face storms, whether those storms come because of me. Honestly, if I don't pay my taxes, if I don't pay my taxes for five years and suddenly the IRS shows up at my door to arrest me, that's not God's fault. God was saying, I told you to pay your taxes every year. I sent you a notice. I sent you a W-2 in the mail. I sent you everything you needed. It's not God's fault, but some and many storms come upon our lives because we live in a fallen and a broken and a sinful world and our bodies have to go along with that. I cannot live forever. You cannot live forever. Storms are going to come, so how do you do it? You do, you keep your focus on Jesus. You keep your focus on Jesus no matter what is happening in your life. Your focus beyond this is Jesus Christ. He's proven it. Don't be afraid, he said. Come to me. Here's what I love in verses 31 and 32. Or, uh, yeah, 31 and 32. Was that Peter might have chickened out, but Jesus helped out. Jesus helped out. When he began to sink, I love that scene there in the, the, the background music. And the hand of Jesus going through that water wide open. Come to me. Right here. Right here. Now, I've said this often every time I think about it. Peter's lucky that I was not Jesus. Because I've told you I would have gone, whoa, <laughs> fooled you. Jesus didn't do that, and he won't do that to you or me. When you're in the storm of life, Jesus' hand is always there to take you and to pull you back up. And I love the scene. I love him going, don't let go. 
Don't let go of me. You can say that to Jesus today, okay? That's okay, whether that ever happened or not. But that's what you can say to Jesus. Don't let go of me. Don't let go of me, Jesus. Hold on to me, Jesus. I'm here, Jesus. Take care of me, Jesus. Get me through this, Jesus. Help my faith to grow in this, Jesus. Jesus did not say, he didn't wait to say and get in the boat and make an example of Peter. He didn't do that, friends. He's not going to make an example. Right there, he says, just why did you doubt me? Think about it right now. As Jesus whispers to you, all he wants you to do is don't doubt me. Now, Satan is going to ask the question, yeah, you're a doubter. You didn't put your faith in Jesus. You took your eyes off of Jesus. You're not worth it. That's not what Jesus said. Don't let go of me. Then Don't doubt me. Don't doubt me. I'll take care of you. I'll walk with you. I'll be with you. I will get you through this storm. But my friends, we've got to be willing to get out of the boat. The twists and turns in life, they're going to come. There's no doubt about it. And we have a focus point. We have Jesus Christ. And he'll walk with us. So what do you think the safest place was at? James, John, Andrew, those, those fishermen, they believe the safest place that night was in the middle of that boat. But only Peter found the safe place. It was in the middle of the storm. It was in the arms of Jesus. As he walked back on water. My friends, we need some water walkers. Maybe this morning you need prayer. There are people at the back and there'll be people up front to pray with you this morning. There'll be people to help you with the decision if it is for the first time to give your life to Jesus Christ. There are people here to talk to you. We have everything that you need to take care of that for you to be baptized into Jesus Christ to be able to have his arms around you no matter what storm you're going through. But I ask you, don't put off. Don't wait for somebody to pray. Don't wait for tomorrow. Let's get out of the boat today. Let's ask God to save us as we stand and we sing together this morning. You come if you need prayer.